we really want to work towards a more quantitative understanding of waves. Quantitative meaning that we can deal with numbers in actual equations. So in this video we're going to work toward the universal wave equation, but before I get there, we're going to take a closer look at frequency and wavelength. In order to do this, I'm going to be utilizing an interactive simulation from the University of Colorado. They have a site called PHET where they have a whole bunch of really cool simulations, and I'm going to be using the wave on a string. So this is what the uh, simulation basically looks like. I encourage you to go try it for yourself. The basic idea is that you can oscillate this wrench to create a wave in this string, and then there's a whole bunch of variables you can change. So first thing I'm going to change is this end. I don't want an end on my string because you might have just noticed that if I have an end there, my wave bounces, and waves that are bouncing and coming back are going to interact with new waves that we send, and we just want to keep this simple for now, so we're going to just let this string go out an open window. We also can change the amount of damping that our spring has. So you might have noticed that our spring, our wave that I just made, it died out after a few seconds. That's because of this damping. It's basically a measure of the internal friction in the spring. So if we get rid of that altogether, of course physicists love no friction situations, then our, our wave, or our sp string, will pretend that there is no friction involved. We can also change the amount of tension in our string. So with high tension, let's just have a quick look at how it behaves. Okay, our wave traveled out the window. Now what if we go all the way to low tension and compare? Ah, now our wave travels much more slowly along our string. Now you might be thinking to yourself that you've never seen a string behave quite like that before, and that's true, because of course every string in real life has some damping to it, and there's limits on, on how little tension you can get to it and things like that. So we're idealizing the situation so that we can observe properties of waves. So the first thing I really want to notice is this thing about tension, that if I have a very low tension, my propagation is very slow along the string. String. Whereas if I give myself a very high tension, my propagation is really high and my waves are gone in no time. So let's quickly note that. Um, I'm just going to sketch a single hump wave, and we always call the propagation this movement of our wave. So this is what we call propagation. And we said that the speed of propagation depends on the medium. Now I'm just going to write medium for now. We had this one feature of our medium that we called tension and our speed depended on that, our speed of propagation. But I'm just going to leave this as generally saying that the speed of propagation depends on the medium because if we're dealing with something like sound, we don't call the air uh, more or less tense. We don't measure tension in the air, we measure density. So there's there's different things we measure depending on the medium, but we know that there's something fundamental about the medium that changes the speed of propagation. And in our string, that happens to be tension. The next thing I want to talk about is the frequency. Now we know from our oscillations chapter that frequency is a measure of how many cycles per second. So this is really just the oscillation of the source. It's a matter of how many times the source oscillates per second. So let's see what that looks like. Let's give ourselves a medium tension in our string. And let's try a slow frequency, meaning only a few oscillations per second, compared to a fast frequency, lots of oscillations per second. If I pause it here, you'll see that my fast frequency, which looks a little erratic, has really short, choppy waves. Whereas my slower frequency had much bigger waves. And these seem course because it's easier for me to control they seem to be a little more even a little more nice well to get a better picture of this I'm gonna set this uh, little animation to have an oscillator on its own and now we have an oscillator here and we can set it to an amplitude that we want and we can set it to a frequency that we want so let's just start by seeing what this looks like hey look at that nice little oscillator keeps a steady frequency makes a nice wave for us so changing the amplitude, of course, makes this a bigger or smaller wave, as in more vertical height. You can make it really small, too, but it's probably easier to see on a fairly large amplitude. And now let's see what happens when we adjust the frequency. So if we go to a really 
slow frequency we get this really lazy wave really high frequency we get this really crazy wave so it all comes down to lazy or crazy if we have a low frequency we get a wave that looks kind of maybe something like this if we have a high frequency we get a wave that looks like this now let's just notice on these sketches if we would measure the wavelength of this wave here this lambda this is a very large wavelength if we have a low frequency and if we have a high frequency we have an extremely short wavelength so again we can verify this in our simulation if we would just freeze this for a minute on our high frequency we can see very easily that this wavelength here is pretty short whereas if we let this go again but turn it to a very low frequency oh, that's going to be too low like this you can see that from here to here is our wavelength, which is a very large wavelength. But now you should also be remembering that there was another factor that made kind of the same difference, and that was tension. Tension did sort of the same thing. So if I would set my frequency sort of somewhere in the middle now, and now I start adjusting my tension, a very high tension increases my wavelength, and a very low tension decreases my wavelength. So again, let me just pause it here. We're at now low tension. We've got very short wavelengths. If we would go to a high tension, we've got very long wavelengths. So let's just write in our notes that this condition here seems to go with a slow medium. Now again, I'm going to write slow medium rather than um, low tension because this depends on what kind of medium we're talking about and I want this to be general for all waves so it could be low tension could also be um, a certain air density and this situation over here seems to go with uh, a fast medium so let me just change a few things around here um, let's not make the frequency actually the deciding factor here let's list it as one of the things that sort of goes together so low frequency or slow medium or large lambda those are things that seem to all go together and same thing with a high frequency on this side so this is more like if we have a large wavelength it could be due to one of these two factors if we have a small wavelength it could be due to one of these two factors a fast medium or high frequency I also want to just quickly point out that um, this picture that we're looking at here is actually sort of uh, a direct picture of what we saw so on this x-axis in this picture is actually uh, displacement or the distance of the graph. Now the other axis is also displacement, right? This is the displacement of our oscillator and the horizontal axis is the displacement of our wave. So it's not like we're graphing over time here. I just want to make it clear that this is like a literal picture of our wave. Now again, if we would graph over time, a lot of these concepts they stay the same. We just have to make sure we're clear on what we're talking about because this wavelength is measured in meters and therefore this this should be a distance so anyway these associations that a large wavelength goes with either a slow medium or a low frequency and a small wavelength goes with either a fast medium or a high frequency this forms the basis for the universal wave equation and the universal wave equation is this velocity is equal to frequency times the wavelength and this makes 100 percent perfect sense with the things that we observed because we saw that whenever we have a large wavelength either the frequency has to be small or the velocity has to be high high velocity gives a high wavelength or a small frequency gives a high wavelength and vice versa a small wavelength is either from a large frequency or from a small velocity right so if you try to hold any one of these constant then the other two have to vary according to the things that we observed in our simulation. So let's just suppose holding velocity constant, if our medium is not changing, then having a larger frequency has to have a smaller wavelength. Because if we increase this number and times it by a smaller number, we'll still get the same number. And vice versa. So this works with all the things that we observed. Now you already know how to calculate the velocity if you're given distance and time. Now we can add to the sort of things we can calculate about waves and we can calculate frequencies and wavelengths based upon that velocity. So now our knowledge is becoming a lot more specific. So you'll have to use this equation in some of the problems that you'll do.